Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam Amma ba'da habiti fillah A question was asked, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh I'm a fan of your videos, what do you think about uh, Mufti Munir linking up with Ikhwanis like Ali Dawa who's made a video with his teacher speaking against what he calls Madkhaliya and Muhammad Hijab who calls for leaving of differences with the people of innovation and uniting with them and then you sent me a YouTube uh, video. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us with ikhlas, with thabat ala sunnah to Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and may Allah wa ta'ala forgive us all of our many mistakes and bless us to be followers of the beloved sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, May yuradullahu hi bihi May yuradullahu bihi khayran yifiqlu fi deen Whenever Allah wants good for a person, he gives him fiqh fi deen gives him understanding uh, of the religion. Uh, something that's very important here, as I see, unfortunately, uh, when I made the video that there's so much controversy and probably within an hour there was more hits on that video than teaching whole books will ever accumulate within even that one hour, uh, within a year. A year's worth of lessons, uh, books of the Salaf or what have you, or anything beneficial knowledge, be idnillah ta'ala, will never get that kind of, uh, that kind of viewing. And this shows us the status that we're in, that we have not prioritized the important uh, aspects of our religion, that we should be focusing on learning and bettering ourselves and not it is not from the awliyat, awliyat, meaning the first things that we learn in our religion is how to refute someone, who to be, who to listen, and who to stay away from. No doubt we need to know about the people we take knowledge from, and no doubt they need to be from Ahl sunnah No doubt they need to be following the madhab of the Salaf. However, when we do find individuals who call to the book and the sunnah, we find every excuse to belittle and take them down and usually this is because unfortunately a lot of times it's not the fault of the common people but it's the fault of other people who are callers and they're at times uh, destructive behavior and also due to hisbia that some individuals they call to themselves, they call to their group, they call to their sect, they call to their clique. And if you're not really with their program, or they see something in which they feel is bid'ah, or you're not sitting with the right people, they will open, lift the pen and open the pages and fill them with ways to belittle and assassinate your character. And this is why, and what I believe has happened with our brother, uh, Muhammad Munir. Uh, as far as Ali Dawa and the uh, brother uh, Muhammad Hijab, I don't really know much about them. I've heard and seen uh, maybe their faces and, and so on and so forth. And I believe I communicated once with the brother Ali Dawa. He sent me an email or something like this. I believe so. Uh, some time ago. And all I can say is from my limited knowledge and from brothers that I trust in the UK completely that are Salafi and look at these issues from what was related to me is that he's Salafi, that he calls to the book and the Sunnah, that he's a youngster who's out there in the trenches and has popularity with the youth. Now, if these statements are truthful, and again, I don't have time for the video, nor am I going to waste my time on those kind of activities because I have way too much important things that will further my knowledge and help me to build my family and help me to share with others and especially Ramadan is, is near. So I don't really have time nor am I really concerned about those things and this is part of the problem is that we have everyone concerned about maybe past mistakes or statements someone makes. If it's true that the brothers made these statements about Sheikh Rabi or what have you, then he should review his self and look into what the sheikh is called to and look to the good that the sheikh has brought forth and we ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives the sheikh 
Sheikh for his shortcomings and blesses us all to make toba before the hour is established. So what I would say is, if it is true, then uh, this is issues that he needs to work out and it is not a condition of Salafiyya, nor is it a condition of Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah that you like my Sheikh or you like this Sheikh. But however, to belittle the ulama is something different. Now, with regards to the issue of, of Muhammad Munir, because so many people spoke about he's sitting with Ahl Bid'ah, and they claim they make this claim. I wanted to mention something, and unfortunately it's a bit long, and I'm going to try my best to be as concise. Uh, Imam Abdul Muhsin al-Abad, Hafizullah Ta'ala, he mentioned in his book, Rifq, uh, Mercy Between Ahl Sunnah. He said, that which has taken place in this time is some of Ahl Sunnah busying themselves with criticizing and boycotting some of Ahl Sunnah. And that which follows from this is splitting apart, differing, and abandoning. And what was more appropriate, rather, necessary, was mutual affection and showing mercy to each other and standing together in one line in the face of the people of innovation and desires. And those who differ with Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, and there are two reasons for this, meaning for this fitna. He said, the first, that amongst uh, Ahl Sunnah in this time is he whose main concern in business is following up on the mistakes of his brothers and searching for them. Whether these mistakes are in tapes, books, then warning against what took place with some of these mistakes and some of these mistakes which the person who committed them is criticized for and warned against uh, for cooperating, for instance, with one of the jami'at, meaning these... Uh, groups, these Dawa groups or organizations, by giving lessons in them or taking part in seminars in them. And this Jem'iyyah was one that uh, Sheikh Abdulaziz bin Baz and Sheikh Muhammad bin Uthaymeen, rahimahullah ta'ala, would give lessons in via telephone and is criticized for taking uh, part in the Jem'iyyah in a matter that those two noble ulama gave a fatwa for the permissibility of doing so. And it is more priority for a person to denounce his opinion than the opinions of others, and especially if this opinion is one that the kibar ulama gave fatwa for its correctness. And some of the companions, radiallahu ta'ala anhu majma'in, would say that after the recon reconciliation of Hudaybiyah said, denounce your opinions with regards to the religion. This is imperative that we stop here and take a look at this and see how this can benefit us. Because first and foremost, the major mountains of this era, that there should be no doubt that they were imams of Ahl Sunnah in this time, Imam bin Uthaymeen and Imam uh, bin Baz, made fatwa about the permissibility of doing this. And again, these, these things, I didn't want to open these doors, but these things have criterion. There's no doubt someone posted a kathrata or plethora of narrations of the Salaf. And there's no doubt that those are authentic and beautiful narrations of the Salaf, letting us know that the asl of sitting with Ahl Bid'ah is, is that it's impermissible. The asl is, the foundation principle, is that it's impermissible. Walakin, walakin. However, we must go back and we must look at the Musalih when Mufasid, like any like many things in the religion, there's a principle of looking at the harms and the benefits of doing so. Of, of many Messiah in the deen and especially making uh, a hukum ala akhirin, you know, or, or on how you uh, fi in the deeds, in the actions of Mu'amalad, on how you deal with one another. For example, the issue of hajr, of cutting someone off and boycotting them. That this, the, the origin of this mesela, and, and for more details, you can go back to Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah. We're going to mention some, a few things, and I'm sorry for the length of this video, that it's probably going to grow as it usually does, especially with about these heated topics, because there's no way I can give it any kind of justice if it's super short and concise. I just can't. So, with regards to that, we know that the harms and benefits is very important, and these great imams did it. So are you going to say they're mumayya? It's permissible? For some of Ahl al-Ilm and not others, no doubt they were major scholars. We can't compare our brother. We love him and he's doing a great job and he has ilm wa fiqh. But he's obviously not on the level of our imams. Okay? But he studied at the feet of great imams and benefited and shows his benefit. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserve him. So, we must look that this principle is am for the people of knowledge, for the people who have who are grounded in the religion, meaning not for everyone to sit with Ahl al-Bidah, because we know that's the usul is no. Now, they gave lectures. 
How many Imam Abdul Musan? Uh, how many his son Sheikh Abdul Razak? And how many others actually go and sh uh, go to uh, some organizations and have ta'awun with them and give advice to them and sit with them? Not sitting and just getting comfortable in their bid'ah and taking the principle of the Quran and Muslimin, we excuse you and you excuse us and we unite in that which we agree upon. No. But these ulama are known for giving da'wah and not having conditions placed upon him. I personally asked about seven ulama when I lived in Medina and I've recorded all of them. One day I will release some of those recordings or maybe all of them. I asked Sheikh Salih Suhaimi, I asked Sheikh Ibrahim Rahili, I asked Sheikh Salih, uh, uh, Sheikh Suleiman Rahili. I tried to ask Sheikh Obeid, but he was sick at the time. Uh, and I know his view is different, but just to be well-rounded, I asked Sheikh Abdullah Abelan, I asked Sheikh, um, Sheikh Saeed bin Hulayl, these are Medina, I mean, these are ulama in Hail and others. And all, they all said, Sheikh Ibrahim gave a beautiful answer, which he gave with a nus, first and foremost, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam said, لِيَنْ يَهْدِيَ اللَّهُ بِكَ رَجَلٍ وَاحِدٍ خَيْرٍ لَكُمْ مِنْ حَمْرَنَا that if Allah guides one person by your hand, it's better for you than the red camels. The red camels were a very uh, expensive form of wealth for the Arabs in the past. Letting us know that Hidayah, and that's what Dawah is. Dawah is not just for, as they say, the converted. Those people who already have the same belief as you. Dawah is for everyone. And that means Dawah for Ahl al and we're going to come with the proofs very shortly. And so letting us know that these things, there's more to these issues. It's not black and white. You can't just cut and paste some athar of the salaf and throw it at the people. But instead you need fiqh fi deen. That's why I mentioned that hadith in the beginning that we need fiqh fi deen. We need to understand. And I'm going to give you an example from someone who is very shadeed on the people of bid'ah and some people and very controversial. Sheikh Rabi, for example. And why would he explain some of those books of the salaf like sharia, which is somewhere back here? Why? If it was sufficient just to cut and paste, he wouldn't need to say anything. But he explained it. He taught it. And he gave the tafsil about some of these issues that looking at the harms and benefits. Because it's not a black and white issue that you can just run with and then make tabdi uh, with anyone who you, and, and of anyone who you think differs with you. Another important benefit I want to mention with regards to this is that the ulama of sunnah, the imams, that they busy themselves with uniting the hearts of the people instead of, as Sheikh Abdul Masan said, he said that in this day we have some that they spend all of their time. That's because Allah has favored them either to be big businessmen or engineers and stuff. They have money. They can sit in their chair and sit on the internet and go to Twitter and make new uh, posts and they can break down their enemies' lectures. And their enemies happen to be people who call to the sunnah. This is, uh, this is something we didn't see in the past. So it's just amazing now how destructive elements who claim to be from our Tao, because I'm not going to give it to them. I'm not going to say that what they're doing is Salafi. I'm never going to give that up. That's not what I came to. That's not what I learned from Imam Muqbil. That's not what I learned from even uh, Sheikh Yahya Hujuri and others, and Sheikh Abdullah, uh, and then all the ulama in Medina and in Hail and, and other places. I didn't learn that from them. That's not what they called us to. They called us to unite the hearts of Ahl Sunnah, a moment, a moment. So then our Sheikh Abdul Masan, he mentions, and those who have been criticized is he whose benefit is great, meaning that sometimes there are people who criticize by their own brothers of Ahl Sunnah. And they have immense benefit. But their brother is busy belittling, destroying, and only Allah knows why. Whether that be through giving lessons or writing or speeches, and he is warned against because of the fact that he is not known for speaking about a specific, in, uh, a specific individual or group. So this uh, shows you here that sometimes people warn against someone. They'll say so-and-so is not harsh enough against Ahl Bidah. Perhaps he loves Ahl Bidah, or we saw, we saw his group sitting with uh, people who look like Ahl Bidah. You would be amazed at all the stories we could relate over the years about some of the insanity that has taken place. Wallahu musta'an. Then the Shaykh, he says, for example, rather the matter, <coughs> the matter of criticism and warning against people has reached the last remaining of the few 
people in some of the Arab states. Those whose benefit is much and efforts are great in making apparent the sunnah and spreading it and calling to it. And without doubt, warning against the likes of these people involves cutting off the means of benefit between the students and he from whom it is possible to benefit in knowledge and manners. So sometimes you have people, you have a small community. For example, we know Muhammad Munir, he's from Philadelphia. There you have a lot of students. You have a history of Tulab al-Ilm and people. I can think of so many that I know that are now Imams that are there that we were in Medina at the same time, and then those before them, and those who will come later. So they have a lot there. But in some places you have very few, or maybe one or two, and if you take away the good that they're giving, and that they're raising the people with, and you destroy and belittle them, who's gonna be left? Who's gonna be left to call to the Sunnah? Because of either their mistakes, or their perceived mistakes. Meaning that you perceive it's a mistake, but it may not be a mistake, it may be your tasawwur. And what did the scholars say? That a ruling on something, part of a ruling on something, is that you have a correct uh, tasawwur, you have a correct picture of it. And likewise, this goes with fatawa. This goes with fatawa. How many people have destroyed du'at, like Muhammad Munir, trying to destroy, like they're trying to destroy him, and others that have already been destroyed and already been taken out the da'wah, for this reason and that reason, because maybe a sheikh in a faraway land, for example, in Saudi Arabia, is talking about a person way in uh, Alaska somewhere. Sheikh, we have this guy and he does this, da da da. Mubtedia, khalas, he's off it. All the khair he brings to that, that uh, locality is now finished because there's no one to replace him. He was the most knowledgeable, he's the one who studied. You see the problem with that. And Another problem with that, there's two issues, as our Sheikh just mentioned in a dars uh, that we're studying in Asul Sunnah, Imam uh, Ahmed, Sheikh Ibrahim Rahali. He just mentioned about the same principle. And he mentioned two, two issues with that, that principle. That the ruling, part of a ruling on something, is that you have a correct image. For example, that means the Mufti, the one who's being asked the question, needs to know the background about that individual. They need, you know, correct information. Because if I just give some characteristics, and then he says, yep, move he, do he doesn't know the implications of his fatwa and destroying a whole, all the khair in that whole ballad, maybe a whole country, maybe a whole continent, practically. And the second thing is that the person who is describing the issues of that to, to the sheikh needs to also, you know, give the details. So that way a correct hukum can be implemented. So we see the mufasid and the difficulty uh, with these issues. So Sheikh, he said, for example, rather the matter of criticism and warning against people has reached the last remaining people, and we just mentioned that. And then he says, and the second, so he's bringing a second point here, is that of Ahlul Sunnah is he who has saw a mistake in a person from Ahlul Sunnah would write a refutation of him, then he who has been refuted writes a refutation in return. Then both of them busy themselves in reading what the other has of old writings or speech and listening to what he has of tapes as well to pick up on his errors and to catch his flaws and it could be that some of these mistakes are due to the proceeding of the tongue you know that he he spoke and he didn't get a chance to correct it he just made a mistake because all the children of adam commit sins and make mistakes and the best of those who sin and make mistakes are those who repent and then he says, he takes it up for himself or another does it for him. Look at how many people they actually have almost research teams to find the mistake. There's no way some of these guys could be producing practically books, 20 page refutations, 5, 10, 15, 20 page refutations. You know, a man is just given a speech and within 24 hours, there's 5 to 20 page refutations because some of these people have armies of spies in a sense doing their work doing their bidding. And some of them, they have nothing better to do. I guess their ibadah is very strong. So I hope one day to be, you know, have my ibadah like that where I can devote more time and energy to refuting uh, Ahl al-Bidah, uh, but not refuting my brothers. But that takes time and it takes fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it takes, uh, you know, not having so many sins and your own issues to work out. Wallah, Mr. An.
as the Salaf used to say, busying yourself with your own issues. The one who, who has time to spend all of their energy and efforts, then they, they've obviously, they miss their own mistakes. And that's just, just the general uh, meaning of one of the athar. Uh, so then the Sheikh says, he says, the one he meets to take a position on the one who does not help him. And if he has made tibdi of and following that is his boycotting and the actions of these helpers to one of the side. So this, what, what happens is, is people begin to make al-wala wal-bara based on these things. For example, oh, Khalid Green made a video about uh, Muhammad Munir. He's defending ahl bid'ah because Muhammad Munir is a bit mubtadi'ah and he sits with mubtadi'ah and you know, it goes on and on. And then you listen to Khalid Green. Oh, you put a comment on his YouTube, you're a mubtadi'ah too. So this is how it, it goes. And subhanAllah, the people don't see the resemblance but because I've looked in the issue of takfir for some years, and that was what my master's thesis was about, this is what they call the, the, the uh, some of the ulama, they mentioned to silsila fi takfir. That this is like how, how the, the, the takfiris, they make, you know, like for example, Faisal, he would say, you know, this is clearly a case. I'll never forget the statement. It, it's something like this. I might be distorting a little bit. He said, Clear, clearly this is a case of the kafirs calling kafirs kafirs. So he just made... You know, it's a tasilsila. It's like this one's a kafir, and he rejected this one. Who is a kafir? Who this one in turn was already a kafir. You know, he was like, you know, amazing. He was a good illustration of this tasilsila fi takfir. And this is what you have so many. For example, they'll say, oh, these are their guards. These are the, the, the people in the masjid are hypocrites. I've met people actually who said this. And this one is this, and this one is this, and the lay person is a disbeliever because they pray behind that imam who is a hypocrite, who is in turn uh, paid by the government, who is a disbelieving government, and so the imam is really a disbeliever. And, you know, it goes on and on and on. And this is tasilsila fi takfir. Now, we see these same traits with some people who make tibdir. Those who don't make tibdi of an innovator, then they're an innovator. Well, how do we apply this qaida? Sheikh Abdul Masin mentions this. We, you know, we can write a book about some of this stuff. That's why I can't give it its right. But I'm going to try to just hit some different points here. And the point being, Habitifillah, is that uh, there are some people, they will make, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, a chain of, of tibdi as well. And the scholars, they mention, like Sheikh Abdul Masin mentions about this, this uh, principle, and I think it's a principle from Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, where he says this, that this is for, you know, the one who's a clear mubtadiyah. It's not just from people's ijtihad. For example, the one who doesn't make, uh, you know, tabdiyah of a qadriyah or a jahmiyah or a jahmi or a uh, mu'tazila, these old sects, then they are from them, you know. This is not for someone who just because of your supposed ijtihad, which you may not even been ahlan for that, you may not even have the prerequisites and the knowledge for that, just because you make tibdi of him, that you're going to then in turn, the one who doesn't agree with you, if he doesn't agree with you, you make tibdi of him, and it just follows and follows. And look how much fitna we have in our Western community. No, in fact, don't, be, don't think it's in the West only. It's in Indonesia. It's in Somalia. It's in Ethiopia. It's in all the Arab countries, Minbabal Ola, because they got this tarbiyah from certain individuals. And then they just spread it and spread it and spread it as if it's a qaida of deen. And then when we look at it, and it's also, we find that some of these qaida, some of these principles, where do they come from? We don't even find them, uh, you know, in the text. We don't even find them from the mutaqaddimin, the ulama, uh, uh, the salaf. We don't find them. And this is what why we have these major scholars and why I advise you stick with those uh, major scholars, especially be, and those who are have that same tarbiyah, uh, even from younger scholars that can give you that great uh, benefit and uh, knowledge. So taking someone off the sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, is not a light and an easy matter. Uh, Imam uh, Al-Albani said, Hafidhullah, uh, Rahmatullah alayhi rahmatin wasiya about taking someone off the sunnah, you know, so for example, those people want to take Muhammad Munir off the sunnah of the Prophet but they, they can't because it, it's with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's on the sunnah if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees for him to be on the sunnah and if he's adhering to the book and the sunnah and he's calling to it, okay, regardless of whatever mistakes he makes, that if it is not something that's taking him out of the fold of Ahlul Sunnah, then who is Sunni? Imam al-Albani said, 
So this person, he was asked about someone uh, calling himself Salafi and, and making mistakes. He says, so this person who affiliates himself to the Salaf al-Saleh as it relates to how close or far he is in actualizing his affiliation to the Salaf al-Saleh, meaning they practice. It is said about him, he is with the Salaf al-Saleh. And due to this, it is not correct to speak of his having left Salafiyya. He who proclaims even with his tongue, at the very least, it is not correct to say that he is not Salafi, so long as he calls to the minhaj of the Salaf. Salaf al So long as he calls the people to the following of the book, to following the book and the sunnah, and, and being fanatically, and not being fanatically a bias to an imam from amongst the Muslims. To say nothing of being fanatically biased to a way from amongst the ways. To say nothing of being fanatically biased towards a hiz from amongst the ahzab. However, this person has some opinions that are incorrect in some of the issues in which there is ijtihad. And this is bound to happen because everyone makes a mistake. However, what concerns us is the principle, is he a believer in it and does he call to it? So this is very important. And I want to get back to the issue about Muhammad Munir uh, sitting with Ahl Bidah, allegedly, think about this. For one, Imam al Bani, it's well known. How many times, how many t tapes are transcribed with him sitting with jihadis and takfiris and debating with them? This Imam debated, so it was he Mumayyah because he was giving da'wah? That's what the scholars are supposed to do. That's what the students of knowledge in the du'at are supposed to do. That's what a da'i yid'u. Uh, a person who is a propagator, he propagates. That's what their job is. Muhammad Munir's job is to call people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what he's supposed to do. That's what he was trained to do. So take a look here. Imam al Bani says about the principle of taking knowledge from established innovators. This is about taking knowledge from Ahl Bidah. And Sheikh Salih ibn Fazir, I've already translated. You probably won't be able to go through the videos, but it's already there. That already, uh, we already deal with this. Imam Fulzan said, and I don't know why these keep, people keep posting, Imam Fulzan said, don't do this, don't do this. Anyway, we have his, his nas in Arabic and in English. Okay, but in, uh, Imam al-Bani, he says about taking from innovators. Because in general, the asal is his tahrim. The asal is, no, you shouldn't take from innovators, but there may become a necessity. So all of these things, that's why I keep saying, they have musale wa mufasid. So, are you telling me that it's okay in certain situ situations to take knowledge from a mubtadi'ah, but yet you can't give da'wah to them? And you can't sit with them and call others to, to the good? And at the same time, not compromising your da'wah? You know, of course there's conditions. It's not just sitting with the mubtadi'ah and sitting with asharis and sitting with this and sufis and stuff as some of the people are doing, but rather, there's conditions. And there's looking at the greater uh, benefits and weighing the harms. So Imam uh, al Bani said about sitting with established, uh, taking knowledge from established innovators. He said, for example, some of the innovators have knowledge of the recitation of the Quran and Tejweed and the Qira'at. Uh, and what is similar to this? They have knowledge of Nahu and Sarf. You know, these are um, of the Arabic language. They have knowledge of Usul al-Fiqh and Usul al-Hadith. And there is not anyone around the Sunni who is eager in following the Sunnah. He is from whom he can learn from some of these sciences, meaning there's no one of knowledge from Ahl Sunnah around him. So there is nothing to prevent the Sunni in this situation to take this knowledge or that knowledge from such an innovator. However, with the condition that the Sunni is cautious of his innovation. Sheikh Salih bin Fazan said something very similar to that. So it lets us know that even taking knowledge from a mubtidiyah under certain circumstances, if you have no options, you need to learn how to read the Quran, you need Arabic, but you're not taking his politics and you're not taking his aqidah, abadin. You're not taking his minhaj, abadin, his methodology, no. But you're taking in the science that you need because you have no other choice. Either remain jahil or take that knowledge. So how much more when calling? Now, there is so much to say, and uh, there's so many uh, examples. Bin Baz was known to sit, uh, you know, have innovators in his company, and he would give them da'wah. That's their job, those, and those are imams. Now, someone might say, but hey, those are great imams. Those are this. Where do you have Dalil? Where is your evidence to say that this is not am for the person of knowledge? 
Meaning, of course, you have to have to, you have to have itqan, you have to have strength in, in in that field that you're calling to, and 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 know. And if you're sitting with someone who is a mubtadi or someone who's you know in general not from Ahl Sunnah or what have you, then you need to have strength in that and not be compromising. But where is the delil to say that you cannot call those people? To the son of the Prophet sallallahu if innovators, if an Ashari Masjid invites me, I would I would go talk without doubt. As our Sheikh uh, uh, Imam uh, Salih Suhaimi mentioned a statement similar to this. Uh, and how many Imams do this? If you have the opportunity and they don't put any conditions on you, then perhaps there will be great maslaha in that. And it goes back to the hadith that our Sheikh mentioned, the, the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu if Allah guides one person by your hand, this is better for you than the red camels. So your job is not to, as they say, preach the converted, but it's to preach to everyone. And you should want guidance for the, uh, for the, for the innovators or people who have made mistakes. Now, we need to wrap this up, and I know it's been long, and there's, like I said, this is, not, this is just a little bit of trying to deal with your question and deal with the doubts being spread. But there's just so much to say, and we just can't even begin to scratch the surface. That's why whole books. But what I advise is for those who have Arabic, this is a fantastic book. It is called Dawa to Ahl Bida. And who Imam Fozan did the Muqaddama. He read it and he gave the, um, he did the introduction. And this is a well-known book here. It came out some years ago uh, by um, Khalid Ibn Muhammad Al-Zahrani. It's very good. And he's just going into detail about some of these beautiful things. And there's a lot of beautiful books about this. I've got everything I can find. But anyway, so uh, one of the things that he mentions, and he gives some beautiful examples first. So we're going to paraphrase because I don't want to get into Arabic and it's going to take too long. One of the things he mentions as an example about giving Dawa to Ahl Bidah. And, you know, of course, there's conditions for that and, and stuff. And that's why I'm saying it's not a black and white issue. Don't just throw athar at the people and, and, you, and you don't have the knowledge to, to go into those athar and study them and, and contextualize and go into the other text and the many examples of Ahl Sunnah being gentle and giving dawah to Ahl Bidah even. Yes, they were harsh. But as even Sheikh Rabi, who's known, and I always mention him because he's, you know, uh, people like to cite him for much for being harsh. And he's very stern about certain things, no doubt. And very controversial, without a doubt. But even he says these same things about looking at the harms and the benefits, even though he has a lot of fatwa against that. But there's also other things. If you go and look at his fatwa over the years, and if you look at what he did in Sudan, and I actually taught that as one of the things. I went through it. It's translated in English where he, his time of giving da'wah in, to the Sufis in uh, Sudan. So, is he Mumayyah? Is he Mumayyah? Subhanallah wa bihamdi. Do you think everyone he was sitting with and was around him was Salafi? No, he showed gentleness and so forth, and he had a great effect upon them. So this shows you, that's what da'wah is. You're calling people to the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu So one of the examples he mentions is Ibn Abbas going to the Khawarij. Okay, and making the uh, the monarchisha with the uh, you know making the debate debating the Khawarij. He debated them and slapped them up with kitab wa sunnah and taken back to the Quran. And it shows that they were uh, you know their 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 ignorance and how they understood they were so literal. And this is exactly what the tekfiris of today. You don't rule by Allah's law, but they don't even know all those tafsil and that yes, men have a a, 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 a place in hukum according to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Isn't, aren't two people, uh, you're supposed to bring people from the families when you're trying to make islah between uh, uh, a husband and wife? Or many, many examples where you have human arbitrators. So now are you a, a disbeliever because you're now ruling by other than what Allah revealed? No, Allah revealed that. Allah said that man has a, a place in that. But you're not changing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's hukum. You're not changing his laws. So we have to have a, a proper tasawwur of some of these major messiahs. So anyway, Ibn Abbas went to the Khawarij and he convinced him. And they say that a thousand, some scenarios that say two thousand, some say ten thousand or something similar to this of the Khawarij came back away from that. And then the rest he fought. Likewise, Imam Ahmed, Imam Ahmed, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, 
he also, uh, you know, went and he debated and called people that were known innovators that had irja, and that they came uh, back to the sunnah, walillah alhamd. And there's many examples of the salaf. So what do you say about that? What do you say about that, about Mufti Munir calling Ahl Bid'ah or sitting with Ahl Bid'ah? Is he having tea with Ahl Bid'ah and he's compromising the principles of the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? I don't think so. I think you need to learn and I think you need to go, go back into those books. And if you have real questions about this, you need to talk to the man himself. Ask him. Why are you asking me? Ask the man, why is he sitting with so-and-so who has a video saying so-and-so and has done this and so-and-so? You ask this man, this grown man, and you be a grown man and ask him and find out where he is, what his view is on that. If you have issues with Tahir, ask him, why is he doing such and such? Why, why is he sitting with so-and-so? Why did he give da'wah here? Ask, ask. Ask the people of knowledge if you don't know. So it's very important, ahabitifillah that we fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as much as we can. And I ask Allah Azza wa Jal, uh, bless us all with ilm al nafir as kan taybu amal al mutaqabidan. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us of our many sins. Anything I said that was correct was from Allah Azza wa Jal. Anything I said that was incorrect was from myself and the shaitan. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad.